Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. I'm so glad that you get to join us this morning. I'm really looking forward to our time together. We've got some special music guests. We've got a special message out of the Word. And I just, my prayer all week has been that you would be affected and influenced and encouraged by the message of the resurrection. Have a great Sunday. Hey everyone, happy Resurrection Sunday. I hope you all are doing well and staying safe and healthy. He is risen. I was just thinking about what a fitting time it is right now for us to be celebrating this day. And even though as believers we should celebrate it every day, what a great opportunity we have, especially now, to share this message of hope and victory to those around us. With so many people just facing fears and uncertainty, what a great um, opportunity we have now to just say, hey, our God has defeated death itself. There is nothing that we need to fear. And I think it's it's really cool when you think about how Jesus said that he would defeat death, that he would rise again from the grave, and he did that. And if we can trust him on something as big and significant as that, how much more can we trust him on all the other promises that he's given us? So please join me in singing the Easter song.
Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, vainly they watch his bed. day service. I hope today as we're celebrating the risen Lord that we can feel like we're together. We can have the unity that we have. And that you're encouraged uh, as it kind of feels like we're locked away. We can uplift you and remind you as we remind ourselves of the hope we have in our future resurrection from the dead. As Christ comes again, uh, we long for the day when he's in full glory, reigning. Father, we give this day to you. Everything that you would have uh, go on in our lives, Father. We just surrender to that. Father, we look to you for our hope look to you for our strength and our joy and our encouragement. And Father, we want to celebrate your resurrection today, Jesus' resurrection rather, 2,000 years ago, and how we're still waiting for you to come again, to be resurrected, to be glorified with you. It's such a great hope that we have. Thank you for giving us that hope. I pray that you will speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name.
morning again church uh, welcome back hey the tomb is still empty I promise you I was there and uh, just the resurrection is the greatest day in the history of the universe without a doubt Jesus is not dead he is alive and well he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he is prepared a place for us and he's coming again soon to receive us to himself now I want to tell you this morning this is a day that we need because you know the first century when the resurrection happened the times weren't that different than they are today the world was still lost and confused people were in sin they were in bondage to that sin they were without hope and they needed Jesus they needed a savior at that time they needed someone to, to come back from the dead and to rescue them and so Jesus Christ he defeated sin he purchased salvation for those who believe in him that's what makes Good Friday Great Friday the cross was a divine rescue mission for humanity where the rescuer saved those in need of rescue us by becoming by taking our place in death 
A verse that you hear me say all the time is 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is what happened. That's the transaction that took place on Good Friday. But the story doesn't end there. It doesn't stop there. Jesus' death was not the end. As you know, the day he was crucified, two men named Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they asked the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, for the body of Jesus so that they might give him a proper burial. Pilate granted their request and they quickly uh, prepared his body for burial. They wrapped it in linen with myrrh and aloe and then they placed Jesus' lifeless body into a garden tomb hewn out of the stone. Um, it was right there near the site of the crucifixion. Pilate then gave the order to make the tomb as secure as possible. An enormous stone was rolled in front of it and it was sealed with the seal of the Roman Empire. And at that moment, everything seemed lost. That's the way it seemed. Because behind that stone, in the dark, lying dead and breathless on the other side, were all the hopes and dreams of the followers of Jesus. But Sunday was coming. And on Sunday morning, as light broke through the darkness, it says in Matthew 28, that Sunday morning, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I love that. I just sat right down on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now keep in mind, I know you guys know this, but that stone was not removed so that Jesus could get out. That stone was removed so the world could look in and discover that Jesus is risen. He is risen, amen? This is where you say, he's risen indeed. All right, I can't hear you, but I'm trusting that you're saying it. What I want us to consider this morning is that Jesus could have risen from the dead, had let the stone be rolled away, and so that we could see that he was alive, and that would have been enough, just sit, sitting there in the tomb. But Jesus did not stay in quarantine. He didn't stay there. He took the time to find the people that were hurting, to go minister to those in need, and find them right where they're at. And I believe that he wants to do the same with you this morning. He wants to find you right where you're at. Jesus appeared to Mary right in the midst of her heartache and pain. And next we read that Jesus meets two men who felt completely hopeless. Friend, if you have ever felt dejected, let down, discouraged, deflated, whatever adjective you want to use, you have company. Luke records that Jesus appeared to two disciples on, their, on the road to Emmaus that were completely uh, disappointed and um, dejected. They hadn't always felt hopeless, I don't think. I believe that a week before this, they were in the city waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna, believing Jesus was going to be the one to break the Roman oppression, that he was going to be the one to finally step on the neck of the Romans. But now, here, only a week later, Jesus is gone, and hope is gone as well. Jesus has been crucified. He's been laid in the grave, and this wasn't how it was supposed to turn out. Their expectations have been shattered. Hope was dead, buried there with Jesus. And so now, confused and dejected, all these thoughts are occupying their minds as they walked on this long, dusty road to Emmaus. But it's on that road that Jesus met them. He always wants to meet you where you are. And it's not only on that road that Jesus met them, but in their despair, in their hopelessness, Jesus found them. Luke 24 verse 26 says, So it was that while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near. That's what Jesus did. He'll find you there. And he went with them 
but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know them. Very much like Mary, they had their eyes restrained. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And, and he said to them, that is Jesus said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? These guys were obviously visibly sad, depressed. Jesus says, what's going on? Now the one, it says, whose name was Cleopas, answered him and said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Jesus' approach to us, thats this is how he approaches us. This is his, his heart to you and me. What's bothering you? What's going on in your life? What's weighing you down? What's getting at you? But too often, guys, isn't our response like Cleopas's? What does he say? God, are you a stranger? Isn't that how we act sometimes? Jesus, can you even tell what's going on in my life? I'm right here. You know that. Thankfully, Jesus is persistent and patient with Cleopas as he is with you and I. Jesus asks again, what things? Jesus wants us to share our hearts and our hurts and our troubles. And he says, why are you dead? Why are you dejected, Tad? What has victory over you? Why are you so defeated right now? This morning, if, if you're feeling hopeless, the Lord wants to know what's on your mind. Release that to him. You don't have to hold on to that. Release that to him. Cleopas plainly tells him, we were hoping. Now they're hopeless, but we were hoping. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Cleopas basically tells Jesus, God seemed inactive in my life. Jesus is dead to me and my hope died with him. Jesus found him where he was where they were in their hopelessness and he continued to walk with them until it says they drew near the village where they were going and he Jesus indicated that he would have gone further but they constrained him saying abide with us for it is toward evening and the day is far spent and he went to stay with them and it came to pass that as he sat at the table with them that he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them and I think he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And it was then it says that their eyes were opened and they knew him. When these who were hopeless and dejected, when they revealed that their expectations had been shattered to him, when they longed to abide with him, they said, abide with us, abide with us. And when they received the broken bread from his hand, that's when they understood the power of the resurrection in their lives. And they said to one another at this point, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Has your heart been broken? Have you been let down? Have you been disappointed and discouraged? Jesus left the tomb and ministered to the hurting and to the hopeless, and he wants to minister to you as well. Jesus will find you where you are at. Next, Jesus left the tomb to provide peace for those who are fearful. Could we get more relevant than this? Maybe you've heard this as well. Just this past week, I've heard several polls talking about the level of fear in our nation right now. I read this one this week. The LA Times poll revealed that nearly 80% of the people polled feared for their life because of COVID-19. Almost 80% of the people polled. And over 80% we're fearful of the economic repercussions of the virus. Friends, Jesus casts out fear. Later in that day, in John chapter 20, it tells us that the resurrected Jesus sought out a room full of fearful disciples. It says, then that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came 
And he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. These disciples were living in fear. They had just killed Jesus. What are they going to do to us? And so it's night here, it says. These guys are locked in the dark. They're locked away. They're scared. But Jesus met them there. He doesn't just go to the courageous and the powerful. He goes to the fearful. Maybe this morning, maybe you're in a dark time. Perhaps you look at your future and you just can't see how you could possibly get through it. You might put your best foot forward to your co-workers and your, your spouse. You do your best to come across as being strong and brave, like you have it all together. But deep down, you know you don't. You know, I'm afraid if the truth is told, that's, that's where I'm at right now. At this point, the disciples had already heard the truth of the resurrection. It's at the end of the day. They've already heard that, but they have failed to apply it to their lives, and they're still living in fear. They knew firsthand that Jesus had been beaten beyond recognition. They knew he hung on the cross and died. They knew the grave where his body laid, but they hadn't experienced the power of the resurrection in their own lives. If you're like the disciples this morning and you're in the dark and you're shut away and you're living in fear, I want to tell you that Jesus will find you and minister to you where you are. He'll find you there and he has the same message for you that he had for the disciples. Peace, my peace be with you. Do you have that peace this morning? Are you living in it? Or you just know about it? Have you heard about it? Are you experiencing the peace that Jesus has for you? Are you at peace with yourselves? Are you at peace with others? And most importantly, friend, are you at peace with God? Long lasting peace can only be found in one place and it's found in Jesus. Jesus will find you where you're at. He sought out the grieving and the hurting Mary. He found the hopeless and depressed disciples on the road to Emmaus. He brought peace to those in fear. But maybe this morning you're experiencing doubt. Maybe you've become jaded and skeptical. John 20 verse 24 says, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. We don't know where he was, but I'll tell you this, my friend. He was he missed the gathering of the believers and he missed seeing Jesus. You can do with that what you want, but that's the reality. The other disciples, therefore, because he wasn't there, said to him, we have seen the Lord. We've experienced this, they say. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of his nails, and I put my finger in the print of his nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, he's called the twin here. There's many of us, perhaps, who are his twin. Yeah, you're going to have to prove this to me. This is why they call him Doubting Thomas, right? Maybe Skeptical Thomas would be a better description. He would probably prefer... I'm Thomas that's honest about how I'm feeling right now. I'm skeptical. That's just the reality. Pessimistically, he says, you, the women, they might, you might say that Jesus is alive. Yeah, he was here. You might tell me what he's done in your life that, oh, he gave you peace. That's great. But I need to see it to believe it. And not only do I need to see it to believe it, I have to touch him before I will believe. He understood what crucifixion was. He understood the finality of it all. And if I don't see him and touch him, he says defiantly, I will not choose to believe. I refuse to believe. Eight days go by with him feeling this way. And then it says after eight days, the idea is the next Sunday, the disciples were again inside. And this time, Thomas was with him. Tom, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood again in their midst and said, Peace to you. Same dramatic entrance, same declaration to the disciples. And then he sought out Thomas. He found Thomas where he was. He said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it to my side. 
Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas, what you're looking for, the assurance you need, the proof of love, the evidence of victory is found in my wounds. That is always where we we should look in seasons of doubt in our own lives. Look to the wounds. Look to, to what Jesus, look at the price that he has paid for you. One by one, Jesus graciously met the demands of Thomas. But then he pointed Thomas and challenged him to believe. He says, don't be unbelieving, but believe. Here you are, you're around others who believe then you don't have affection for me. You think I'm a great teacher, you've thought good things about me, but that's not good enough, Thomas. You yourself need to make the decision to believe in me. Thomas answered that call. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas was honest about his doubts, but he was also honest about the evidence for the resurrection and he responded to that challenge in an incredible way and he, he goes not to say not only I believe he says my Lord and my God this is worship for him now Jesus listen to this after this Jesus said to him Thomas because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe it was a very real belief that Thomas had, but Jesus said there is a special blessing for those who choose to walk by faith and not by sight. Thomas, you've seen and you believe, but blessed are those folks right now in Ellensburg, sitting in quarantine, who choose to walk by faith. Jesus will meet you where you are. He met the brokenhearted and the hopeless. He sought out those in fear and the one who doubted. But maybe this morning you still haven't found a, class, a place where you fit. You aren't heartbroken and, and hopeless and, and you aren't fearful and you're not necessarily doubting. But you know that your relationship with the Lord isn't what it once was. Your walk isn't the same as it used to be. When that rooster crowed on Friday, Peter had already denied Jesus three times. He turned his back on the Lord and he felt shame. He did not, that's not what he wanted to do. He never would have imagined that he would have gotten so far from the Lord. It just, it just happened. Maybe you can relate. John 21 records that after his resurrection, Jesus told his disciples to meet him in Galilee at the mountain he had appointed. Do you want to know where the disciples went? They went to the beach. They didn't go to the mountain. They went to the beach. They went fishing. At Peter's leading, they went fishing. Back to the familiarity of nets and boats and the sound of water lapping on the shore. But it's there, even there, that Jesus came and met Peter. He met Peter in his place of disobedience. He met Peter with his feelings of shame and guilt. Now, after a miraculous catch of fish, the disciples make their way to shore to see Jesus cooking breakfast over hot coals. Now, this seems to me like more than coincidence because the last time, perhaps, that Jesus sat around an open fire was the night that he denied Jesus. And no doubt, he felt less than and he felt he had doubts about himself. He had doubts about what Jesus thought about him because he's been in disobedience, because he turned his back on the Lord. What does God even think of me? What does Jesus think about me? Well, Jesus is aware of his, his inner turmoil. And now around another fire, Jesus meets Peter where he is. And not only is the fire familiar, the number of questions that Jesus has for Peter is familiar. Three times Peter denied Jesus when asked about him. And now he is asked by Jesus three times, Do you love me, Peter? Not so that he would realize Peter's level of devotedness, but so that Peter himself would know. You see, before Peter had bragged, not too many days before this, Peter had bragged, even if they, the rest of the disciples, deny you, I will never deny you. He made that claim 
based on the belief that he was strong and that he was steady and that he could accomplish what he set out to do. But now, with his own weaknesses painfully obvious to him, he says to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you, Lord. I love you, but you know me better than myself. You know all things. And every time Peter says, yes, I love you, you know all things, Jesus responds, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Guys, maybe you need to hear this this morning. Jesus is the God of second chances. You've fallen, you've denied me with your life, you've been disobedient, but the Lord says, I'm not done with you. If you do love me, then get back to the calling that I have for you. Jesus says to him, follow me, which means keep taking the same road that I'm on. Get back in stride with me and go where I'm going. Guys, the resurrection brought Mary from sorrow to joy, from mourner to missionary. Jesus left the tomb and sought out the two on the way to Emmaus and brought hope back into their lives. The resurrected Jesus took a room full of disciples from fear and uneasiness into a place of peace. He brought Thomas from unbelief to belief and from skepticism to worship. And the resurrection allowed Peter to go from disobedience and shame and denial back into fellowship and restoration. Jesus left the tomb empty to meet people where they were. Guys, our God is a pursuing God. Every other religious system in the world, people pursue their God. But only in Christianity has our God pursued us. He seeks us out. And this morning, this resurrection morning that we're celebrating, the tomb is still empty and he's still pursuing people where they're at. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're going through. But Jesus does, and he wants to meet you this morning, right there on your sofa, in quarantine, in your living room, right where you're at, he wants to meet you. This morning, Resurrection Day 2020, God is pursuing each and every one of us, and he can meet each of our unique needs, whether that's comfort, or hope, or peace, or restoration, or even belief. Jesus will meet you there. He said in in, in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice, I will enter. That's the reality. Guys, I want you to know that as a church, as leaders, we've been praying for you this week. We've been praying that you would be encouraged by the message of the resurrection and the power that it provides. And that today, this day, in this unique time that we live in, that this would be a watershed moment in your life. Every single journey begins with a step. And 2020 has been full of enough junk, hasn't it? Let's put something beautiful right here. And if you've never made a decision to walk with the Lord, take that first step of that journey today. Recognize that you're a sinner, that there's none righteous, that you've you've said, done, and thought things that were short of the righteousness of God. Then repent of that. Make a U-turn and begin to stop walking away from God and begin walking with Him. And invite the Lord into your life. Lord, I need you now. I need you to lead me, to guide me. I need your spirit inside of me. And I encourage you, and if you've made this decision, I'm happy for you, but don't put it off if you haven't. Do it right now. We're not promised one more day. Have today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Guys, Jesus said this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me 
shall never die. Do you believe this? Guys, I love you. I hope you had a great resurrection day. Celebrate with your families, and I hope to see you soon.
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, sing that again, open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you.